Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India continue from where we left, we were discussing about uh, one of the manufacturing techniques for powder which is precipitation from liquid. So, we looked at some of the methods including Bayer technique which can be included in this and the others involved uh, compounds such as nitrate, chloride or sulphate from which you can precipitate out powder. Now, there are some more ways where you can get the precipitations or precipitates out from the liquid two of those methods are spray pyrolysis and freeze drying. Uh, it will be much better if we explain this uh, the schematic of the uh, system using spray pyrolysis. So, let me draw this on the board. So, a spray pyrolysis is uh, basically what you are doing is you have a liquid in which you have the uh, super saturated solution. Uh, liquid is basically a super saturated solution and there use allow it to spray through a nozzle or something. So, this is a solution containing the material that you want to precipitate out and what you do is you have a heating zone through which this uh, sprayed solu solution would pass through and when they pass through this because of the heated zone the liquid will evaporate liquid or let me call it uh, solvent. And what you will get is the solute or the powder. So, since you are spraying a very uh, small droplet, so once the liquid from that droplet has evaporated, what you are left with is just a solute, and then those solute will accumulate somewhere over here like this, and you will get the powder. So, this is the technique for spray pyrolysis. Another technique which is uh, similar to this, but in principle you would see is very different is what is called as freeze drying. Now, here the purpose the aim is that you first freeze it and then decrease the pressure. So, that the liquid which is the solvent is able to sublimate. So, instead of evaporating it is sublimate it is uh, sublimating and therefore, you are able to get the just the solute. So, if you were to first let me draw what the pressure temperature plot would look like because this is what makes this process different from the previous one which is spray paralysis. So, here if your if your solvent had a phase diagram like this. So, this is your solid, this is a liquid, this is a vapor phase. Usually, you will be somewhere in this pressure range where it will go from solid to liquid and then to vapor, but if you decrease the pressure enough. So, that you are somewhere over here then solid gets transferred transformed directly to vapor phase. So, this is what you are doing you take the solution you decrease the temperature. So, initially your temperature would be somewhere uh, on the higher range. So, you first freeze it. So, this is the freeze step of the freeze drying and then uh, let me take a different chalk and then you suddenly drop the pressure. Now, when you suddenly drop the pressure and allow the temperature to reach the normal value then what will happen is that here the solute will start to sublimate. So, this is the drying step. and therefore, it is called freeze drying. So, you are first decreasing the temperature and then decreasing the pressure and when you are at this very low pressure where the liquid just directly sublimates instead of going from solid to liquid to vapor it goes from solid to vapor and it uh, leaves behind the particles of the solute and so, you are that is the way you get this uh, powder precipitates. And now, let me schematically draw what so, the now you can imagine the schematic would not be very 
different here again you have the solution which is being spread through this and to decrease the temperature you will have liquid nitrogen. So, this uh, takes care of the first step where you decrease the temperature, freeze it and once it is at low temperature you reduce the pressure and at the low pressure the sol solute uh, the solvent is sublimate uh, sublimates and we are left with only the powder particles. So, you after the pressure so you will after freezing you will reduce the pressure when the pressure reduces liquid sublimates or again let me be more precise precise solvent sublimates and powder solutes formed so these are some of the ways for using or uh, getting precipitation from the liquid. Now, the purity that you will get using this method is known to be of the order of 99.8 percent. This is decent uh, purity, but not very high. Very high purity will be something like 5, what is called as 59 purity or 69 purity, meaning 99.999 that will be 59 purity and so on. Chemically precipitated powder are in the uh, 1 micron size range, but provide characteristics by but the powder characteristics are adjustable through the operating pra parameter. So, now here you see what is something very different from the other processes that we have seen the powder particle size you are getting much smaller powder particle size than we have been able to get through other methods. So, here you are able to get uh, one of the smallest powder size although not very 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 high purity like you get in say electrolysis method but you are get able to get very small powder size. So, that is one good thing about it. Now, uh, agglomeration is common in such precipitate and the question you should ask yourself is why then again you remember what we talked about agglomeration it is proportional to inversely proportional to diameter. Now, if the diameter is smaller then agglomeration would be larger. Let us look at still another process for process for manufacturing which is solid state process meaning the reactants are in the solid state and the product is also on the in the solid state. In some ways even the our uh, oxide reduction was some in some ways solid state, but there we were using hydrogen gas and uh, the product was moisture. So, other than that the reactant uh, the starting material or the origin material was the oxide which was in solid state and the uh, met reduced metal or the element was in the solid state. So, the in that sense it was still a solid state process, but we used uh, hydrogen gas over there, but in here everything is in the solid state. So, reaction takes place in solid state and one of the most common process is what is known as accretion process. This is used for producing silicon carbide and uh, what is much, much more surprising is that this uh, came into being this method came into being more than about a century ago uh, somewhere around 1930s. So, since then uh, this process is being used for producing silica, silicon carbide which is you as you would know is a very useful abrasive and used in wide range of polishing and surfacing application. So, if you have ever done polishing of the samples you know that there are silicon carbide particulates on the lapping paper. So, those silicon carbide are most likely produced by this accretion process. What you do here is that at the core of this there is a graphite or carbon and then on the outside you have the reaction mixture and therefore, and then you heat it and when you heat it then this there is the silic silicon carbide on the outside this uh, sorry silicon dioxide. So, use a we use a heat mixture of silica which is SiO 2 or quartz sand and in this uh, like I said in the core is your coke and you heat it. So, the coke will react with uh, SiO 2 to give you silicon carbide. So, the reaction would be some would be like this it is not a very complicated reaction it is SiO 2 plus C graphite which is at the core gives silicon carbide plus CO2 gas. So, again we have something getting in the gaseous state, but it is nowhere related to the process or it is not even being used for controlling the process parameter like in the oxide reduction. So, 
So, this is also like, like you can see it is in a way oxide reduction, but the overall uh, process parameters that we control are very different. Over there we were controlling the moisture and the hydrogen ratio to ensure that the reaction goes to completion. Over here the reaction is taking place inside this solid state graphite. So, so graphite is at the core, SiO2 is all around it and at the interface you start getting silicon carbide and then CO2 because uh, of the porosity of the SiO2 is able to escape through the gases, escape through the reactants and products. So, this is the mixture and this is uh, as you know this is the product that we are looking at. So, this is the simple reaction that takes place over there. So, come let us get back to our slide and you see. So, this is the carbon which is used in the graphite form which is at the core and here the gray region represents our SiO2 and the white region represents what has already been reacted or which has already been formed as the final product which is sili uh, silicon carbide. And this layer you can say is the reaction layer. So, the, this is where the reaction is going the boundary the, this is the reaction boundary where the all the reactions are taking place. And here also you can say that uh, diffusion will play an important role again because we are talking about a solid state uh, process and when the original particles of SiO2 will have to get converted to uh, silicon carbide. So, here also this uh, diffusion process will play an important role. So, that is the one of the most well known solid state process. Let us get to some more fabrication techniques and uh, one of the most uh, uh, you can say well known by people is the atomization technique. What it does is that in this you disintegrate a melt, you melt the material and then disintegrate the particulates into very, very fine droplets. And once you have those fine droplets, you freeze the freeze those droplets and then you will be able to get very small particulates. So, using this method people have been even able to get nano sized powders because this is you can say a brute force method you are melting the liquid and then disintegrating by, uh, by applying some form of energy that form of energy could be applied through gaseous state or through liquid state and therefore, you have gas atomization technique or the liquid atomization technique. And the overall principle is not very different only some of the process uh, parameters are very are different that we will see in just a few minutes. This is mostly used for metals, alloys and intermetallics with recent applications in polymers and ceramics. So, the most important uh, application for this is metal alloys and intermetallics. Uh, you can realize that we have to heat it all the way to the melting temperature and therefore, only material with uh, not very high melting point would be suitable for this. And that is why it has so far been mostly used for metals, alloys and to some extent intermetallics with low melting point. Ceramics people are now trying to use ceramics uh, to use atomization techniques to get uh, powder particles of ceramics. And like I said the way that you are applying the energy it can be through gas or through liquid and therefore, you have gas atomization or liquid atomization. Let us look at gas atomization and we will spend more time on gas atomization and maybe just one slide on liquid atomization because the overall uh, understanding or the overall uh, fundamentals will remain the same only that some of the parameters which determine the final product size particle size are different and therefore, at the end of uh, these atomization techniques will look at the empirical relation which defines the particle size that you will obtain. So, what you use what you do is use air nitrogen helium or argon which is a gas for breaking up molten stream and this is termed as gas atomization. So, you are using some gas like nitrogen helium argon to break down and so the energy is coming through these gases you are putting uh, flowing the gases at very high velocity and therefore, the molecules have very large very high energy and that energy goes into disintegrating the melt stream. So, the melt gets uh, basically broken into uh, several thousand of small droplets. So, the liquid material is disintegrated by rapid gas expansion out of the nozzle. Main idea is to deliver energy to the molten stream to form droplets which immediately solidify into particles. So, the temperature is kept low enough that du uh, during the process of flight itself the particulates solidify. Higher the energy input, smaller the droplets. So, you can imagine that uh, 
each droplet has some surface area and that surface area is related with energy. So, if you want to have smaller droplets, larger number of uh, larger amount of surface area will be generated and therefore, larger amount of energy has to be invested into this. During the flight through the collection chamber, the droplets lose heat and solidify. This should also give you some hint about the design considerations. You want the powder particulates to solidify before reaching the end zone or where, or where the particulates are being collected and therefore, the length should be large enough that it loses its heat before it reaches there. And at the same time, it should not be small enough that uh, the droplets have not become spherical or of uniform size. We will see about that very soon. And here is a schematic that, uh, that explains how this powder particles are produced. So, in this particular process, this is the liquid melt and it is being uh, sucked in over through here by capillary action and also because of the because the gas is flowing over here. Therefore, it is uh, allowing or causing the liquid uh, liquid level to rise up over here. So, the liquid rises through this tube and the gas that is coming through over here it is being sent at very high velocity. So, that high velocity means high energy. So, high energy is being given to the liquid melt and it breaks down into several thousand small droplets and so it falls like this and during the drop it is during the flight itself somewhere here over here over here it should or it uh, does solidify and by the time it reaches this heap it is already in solid state. And there is a filter over here because in the gas is coming also coming in over here and it needs escape. So, the gas eventually leaves the chamber and you are only left with powder and the gas uh, comes out from this. So, this is the design for a gas atomization one of the design of gas atomization chamber you can this is called a horizontal gas atomization you can also get what is called as vertical gas chamber. So, here is the diagram for a vertical gas chamber. So, here also the you can see the principle remains the same here you are pouring the liquid. So, here is the liquid metal that has been poured and to keep the temperature a little uh, to measure ensure that the metal remains in the liquid state you can even have heaters over here. And then here you are allowing the gas or pushing the gas through this into at just at the point where the liquid exits. So, the liquid so here the gas is coming out at very high velocity and it is shown in a much more uh, you can say um, expanded or zoomed in view is given over here. So, the gas is coming over here and the liquid metal is coming out from here and because of the energy of the gas the droplets or the stream gets disintegrated and you can see that it gets integrated into very small ligaments. And in fact, there are stages of formation of these uh, droplets. So, first it forms ligament then ellipsoid then flake and then finally, the spherical part we will see about that uh, very soon. What we need to focus here is that these powder particles is not uh, sorry not yet the powder particles, but the stream which has been disintegrated are now flowing in different direction and again the size should be such that the powder particulates lose heat and freeze even before they reach the boundary of this cylinder. So, why and why do we want that? Why do we want that it should uh, not hit the walls before it freezes? There are two reasons. One you want that uh, it, uh, it solidifies homogeneously and second if it hits the wall then it will be uh, it will be squeezed and it will be have a flat surface or a flat shape, but what we are what we desire in atomization are spherical particulates. Spherical particulates have uh, some advantages you are able to get good flowability good amount of uh, even compact compactibility and also very high compressibility. So, that is the reason you want uh, uniform shape and that to spherical shape and for that to happen the liquid must freeze on its path before it hits the walls. Now, the size distribution is very wide in when you are using gas atomization technique the size distribution you will obtain is very wide, but it is uh, mostly over 10 micrometer and again you see the size that you will obtain are usually greater than 10 micrometer. If you want sub micron or nanometer range of particulates, so you have to apply some additional technique we will see in one of the last slides when you want to produce. Uh, nano precipitates or nano powders. 
under inert condition high purity powder can be obtained. So, if you ensure that inside the chamber there is no contaminants, it is inert, it does not react with anything, then the powder you can obtain can be very high purity. So, that is one another advantage of gas atomization technique, you can get very high purity pod particulates. Powder particulates are also very chemically very homogeneous, because you have obtained it uh, using homogeneous nucleation and that uh, there was no uh, the particulates are so small in size, they are chemically very homogeneous. You can get cooling rate of the order of 10 to the power 6 degrees Celsius per second during gas atomization. Now, that we are uh, looking at the gas atomization, let us also look at a small amount of uh, let us spend some time on the particulate formation. So, you can see what is the different kind of shapes that form. So, first the liquid comes out as a stream and because there is a high velocity gas also exiting at that point, which which uh, imparts a lot of energy, it breaks into ligaments and these ligament eventually turn into sphere. So, the overall flow is overall uh, change of morphology is actually given over here. So, you uh, in the very beginning just even before it has come out from this stream, it is more like a flake shaped and by the time it comes out, it is in ligament shape and slowly it starts to convert and uh, slowly starts to convert into more symmetric shape, which is ellipsoid and less of uh, ellipsoid with less asymmetry and finally, spherical shape. So, this is uh, the usual particle ch change in the size or the shape change in the morphology. Another thing is that it is not that just one particle of flake will give one particle of sphere, this also will break down into ligament, several ligaments, ligament will break down into even several ellipsoid and so on. So, each at each stage it is still disintegrating because of the energy being imparted by the gas particles. And if you allow these sphere particles which are very small in size to stick to each other, they have a very high tendency to agglomerate again because of the driving force of reducing the surface energy. At this point now that we have seen that uh, the particulars particle morphology moves from ligament to sphere in a position to say something about the size uh, constraint on the ligament and the sphere. So, let us uh, look at one of these equations that define the size relation between ligament and the sphere. So, now we know that uh, initially you get ligament shaped and we can roughly equate it with a cylinder. So, we are looking at ligament, it gets transformed to spherical particle ligament let us say is more like a cylinder and let us say this is L in diameter length and small d is the diameter. And by the end by the time it gets translated transformed to sphere n number of uh, sphere has formed let us say and let us say this is a sphere of diameter d. this one ligament has broken into n spherical diameter. So, volume must be const, uh, volume must be maintained and therefore, we can say the volume of sphere times n number of sphere is equal to volume of one ligament area of the cross section times the length like this or you can say L over n is equal to 2 by 3 d cube by d square. Now, let us look at the surface energy terms. Since this is forming from this, the total surface energy for the n spheres must be less than the total surface energy that we have for the ligament and therefore, we can write what we are doing is just calculating the surface area over here and surface area over here. Since, the surface energy term per unit area is constant on both sides, it gets cancelled out, we are we should be able to get 
the total surface area for this it should be less than the total surface area for this and therefore, from here we will get but we know L over n is equal to 2 over 3 d cube by d square and therefore, we should when you put this over here you would get d should be greater than so we can get a relation between the size of the sphere and the ligament and we uh, this will also be allow us to design the uh, atomizer according to the size that we want to obtain so what it is saying is that diameter of the spherical particle must be greater than 3 by 2 times the diameter of the ligament for this for feasibility of this process. If this is not greater than this what will happen? It will say that the surface area for this is larger than the surface area for this which may which is not uh, really feasible. So, now that we have this we uh, let us look at what it means to us in terms of design. So, if you want to get a smaller particle size if you look at this if you want to get a smaller particle size so that is small d uh, if you want to get this uh, uh, sorry a capital D to be smaller then you this d must also reduce or the diameter of the ligament must also reduce. So, you can it is not saying anything about the length. So, you can have very long lengths of ligaments, but the diameter must be smaller and therefore, if you want to get a smaller particle size let us say you were earlier getting 25 microns, but you want to get now uh, just 10 20 microns or 10 microns. Then in that case what you need to do is reduce or set the parameters such that the ligaments that you are getting have smaller diameter. And one of the ways to do that is uh, you can reduce uh, or you can set the gas parameter such that the overall the critical diameter that you are getting over here gets reduced. So, that so these are some of the things that you will be able to understand or you are able to relate once you uh, see a relation between the ligament and the particle diameter. And this is uh, a micrograph SEM micrograph showing particulates that you uh, that, uh, has been obtained using gas atomization technique and these there are two different condition parameters were used for getting these uh, particulates. In one of them what do you see is very clean and very perfect spherical particles. On the other hand here also you have spherical particles, but on top of that there are some spherical satellite particles. So, these are like satellite particles sitting onto the main particles and the reason the main reason why this one got uh, some uh, satellite particles is because during the flow of the stream at the ejection there were there must have been some turbulence and that turbulence can cause some of the particles to come back and sit on to the top of the particulates that have already formed and that is why you start to see the satellite formation. So, if you want to avoid the satellite formation the best and easiest uh, way is to get rid of turbulence. So, the difference is because of the turbulent and this is not so turbulent flow turbulent causes tur turbulence causes particles to re enter the gas expansion zone leading to the formation of satellite particles. So, this is uh, a little bit about uh, gas atomization technique we will come back and we will start discussion about uh, some of the empirical relations not some, but one em uh, empirical relation that relates the particle size to the parameters used in gas atomization. So, we will come back on to this slide thanks.